Namaste. Welcome to the beginning of another live Sangha. I trust you are as well as you can be in this moment. We are at the beginning of our Sangha, of course, obviously, dedicated to Shravana, hearing. As we begin, I'd like to start with an invocation to the Gayatri Mantra. If you know it, you're welcome to join along with me. Aum Bhur Bhuvaswaha Tatsavitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yonah Prajodayat Greetings, Isabella. You are uh, one of the first ones here. And as we continue awaiting fellow guests like yourself, allow me to set the intention for this space as being a welcoming environment for you and everyone to express themselves. May we come together as fellow students of life to uplift each other, relate in one another's experience, and share positive sentiments. I trust that... Uh, you are as well as you can be in this moment and if not that's okay too may you feel free to express your emotions whatever they may be with uh, mindfulness of our choice of words and thank you dear Isabella for your finger heart Om Namah Shivaya Greetings, dear Marlin. Rana Abu Ahmed. Wow, you have a great memory. A while back, you remember me saying I had a Quran on the coffee table. Did I ever end up reading it? No, not yet, my friend. But it has moved from the coffee table into my room. Right now, I'm reading a book of Sikhism. So I'm learning about the Sikhs. Perhaps I'll tackle the Quran afterwards. And uh, I mean that. I know it's kind of funny because in the... F in the little that I did read, it talks about people who say that they will or and actually don't end up, or they say that they have read it and actually haven't. <laughs> so there's no excuse for me, is there? Radhi or Radhi, dear Magdalene, welcome. Namaste or Diem. I hope you all are well in this moment. Welcome, Asad. I uh, I'm very happy to be here. I hope to be of service. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to have this space with you all in it. Soon I would like to open up our Shravana segment with a short poem by uh, one of you guys. One of you sent in one. As many of you know, we have a show and tell section Today, for our show and tell, we have a poem from Billy that was sent in, I think, last night. And it's a very short one. It's titled, Choose Life. What this poem means to Billy, in her words, I'll speak in the first person, I've been working on recovering from chronic PTSD and childhood abuse. Thinking about taking one's own life is a common experience among trauma survivors, including me, so I wrote a poem about it. I hope it can help someone who hears it or reads it on my TikTok account. So it concerns themes of considering our life, and uh, I know many people might resonate with that. and. It's a little bit of a trigger warning, but it's not a necessarily depressing poem. I hope it's uplifting for you and so you don't feel alone. Without further ado, I'll do my best to recite her poem now for you. Some days are harder than others. Some years and some hours too. But after all these years of ups and downs, I'm still muddling through. 
It often feels like I've reached my max, like I simply can bear no more. My brain will make death the only escape, but part of me knows the score. If I were to do it, I wouldn't ever finish what I'm here to do. I'd hurt those who love me, abandon those who need me, and taint their memories of me too. As hard as it is at times to stay on this earth, in this life that is my own, I keep going, I never give up, each day is a stepping stone. Thank you for listening, and thank you for, Billy, for sending this in to the point, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to read that. What's really poetic, besides the fact that this is a poem, is that she presented it to me in the form of a screenshot of... I think a comment that she left on a TikTok video, and I think it's just touching that there are such poets around this platform writing such things, perhaps, on the spot. How lovely. Thank you. And a good reminder for everyone who's going through it. You're not alone, even if it feels like that. And... May each moment be a stepping stone for you to carve meaning out of this dark void and find the light that's behind this veil within which we are shrouded of our true potential. Namaste. So thank you for listening. I'm very grateful have a show and tell section at the very least you know i hope to echo your words it's important that i take a i take a stance to amplify the voices of those whom might not be able to reach their destinations i think we all can put in a little effort to share something that means something to others and that gives us meaning also Thank you, John Simon, for the harp you sent a moment ago, too. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya One on one, I see that sounds like you're processing some of the really dark parts of our world and it's understandable that perhaps you need someone else to relay these concepts with so you don't feel alone with these very real thoughts of suffering. I hope you know that you're not alone in what you're experiencing and although there is very real suffering in the world, the best thing we can do for it is cultivate a little peace within ourselves, in spite of that so that we create the world that we want to see one step at a time through our own heart and let positivity radiate from there into our community, into the small corner of the interwebs in which we share a slice of and from there around the world. One human being can only be expected to do so much in the way of creating goodness, but you'd be surprised how much a little goodness within our own life, how it makes a big difference. Stay strong, my friend, and remember that you are more than allowed to find some happiness within yourself when there isn't a lot of happiness around because in that darkness, you become the shining light for what's possible in others. Now, this section, as I mentioned, is dedicated to Shravana, the gathering of new experiences, such as hearing from one of you in our show and tell. And if you wanted to share something important to you, 
next time do sign up for the show and tell there's an application form in the link tree in my bio and i hope you make use of that namaste welcome everyone who joined while we were reading the other thing i'd like to do in this shravana section before we move on to manana is to read another chapter from our book hollywood to the himalayas you're very welcome dear one on one and thank you for expressing yourself and thank you babble fishy for your heart me arion tatsat and viber zero thank you for your team bracelet and heart me never expected but always appreciated om namah shakti shivaya and john simon thank you for your team bracelet too om kring kalikaye namaha and yes some of you might notice you have a subscription today that's because jared one of our sanghis has been very generous and yesterday and the day before yesterday gave about i don't know i wasn't counting but maybe 60 70 subscriptions out in total so if you are a frequent guest you might just have a subscription today because of jared so thank you again to him welcome sarah okay let's see where we left off This is the 24th chapter Return to Mother India. Our author has finally gone back to India where she had had the spiritual experience. Let's recount her tales now. April 1997. I sat on the bench outside the departures terminal at San Francisco International Airport. smoking my last cigarette i had tried my first cigarette while sitting on a park bench with friends during junior high and didn't smoke again till i entered woodside women's hospital my freshman year at stanford suzanne smoked as did almost all other women there and in nearly every treatment center group and program i had gone through it was a decent distraction from food She had an eating disorder if you recall in her childhood actually not just her childhood but through some of her adult years as well and the nicotine induced rush was almost as nice as the endorphin rush from vomiting as it was bulimia that she struggled with not quite but almost i had smoked off and on throughout the first half of my 20s In a few hours I would be on a Singapore Airlines flight to India. This time, however, I wouldn't have my husband Jim's lap to lay my head in or be able to laugh with him about the frequency with which Singapore Airlines served food. She had gone with her then husband Jim the first time to India, but they ended up beginning to separate while they were there. now they're no longer together really time to eat again always ready for a good spicy vegetarian meal jim had partaken each time the flight attendants beautiful olive skinned women in brightly colored suits with matching hats had offered this time i was flying alone My remaining possessions were locked up in a storage facility for a year. I had a one-year leave of absence from graduate school. On a deep level, I knew that this year-long sojourn in India was a charade. I was not coming back. And if you recall, when she met her guru the first time, he told her to go back and finish her degree, and she said, "No, I want to stay here forever." <laughs> He said, "Why don't you go back and just do one semester and then if you still want to come back, you can." <laughs> Otherwise, they'll think you're crazy. You're crazy if you stay here. 
This was not just the last cigarette I'd smoke in a year, it was the last one ever. This was not the beginning of a year-long adventure, it was the beginning of the rest of my life. I had spent many minutes standing on my head earlier that evening, a technique Manauso had taught us a way of using yoga postures to prevent airplane-induced aches and pains and mitigate jet lag. I've never heard of that. Any of you, uh, went upside down on your head to mitigate <laughs> airplane-induced aches and pains and mitigate jet lag? I had done backbends and twisted and balanced on my palms and forearms to help my immune system kick in for the long journey. I took a last drag on the cigarette, filling my cold lungs gratefully with hot smoke and held it in for as long as I could, willing the cells of my body to remember this warmth without ever clamoring it for it again. Thank you, I said out loud. Thank you for bringing me home. I stood up into the windy night. Mark Twain is said to have remarked, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. I had been in shorts earlier in the day in Palo Alto and Redwood City. It was now so cold with the bay fog rolling in that I could see my own breath long after the last wisps of tobacco smoke had dissipated. Scott, my closest friend, whose companionship, presence, love, and warm bed had comforted me through innumerable nights at Stanford, dropped me off at the airport. He and I detoured through Denver one summer on our cross-country drive from his home in Meridian, Mississippi, to Palo Alto, in search of Manny, my biological father. In the phone book, I was able to locate the building where Manny worked. The information board in the lobby directed us to his suite. Scott and I rode the elevator together in silence, and he held my trembling hand. Earlier in this book, near the beginning, she talked about how her biological father had abused her, so I imagine this was no easy meeting. It was only when we got off the elevator that I finally thought, what exactly will I say to him? Scott had no answer. What will I do? Between us, we had no idea. Scott reminded me that he was only there on this wild goose chase to support me, that this detour to find and stalk the man who had walked out of my life was not his idea. He had agreed to come along out of love for me. We left the building in Denver without ever catching a glimpse of Manny. Scott was my anchor throughout my years at Stanford and after, through my marriage to Jim and its dissolution. My ardent crush on him was neither diminished nor deterred by his homosexuality. As he dropped me off at the airport, I had no idea when I would see him again. Would it be a year? Many years? A lifetime? Would India swallow me up and hold me so deep in her womb that it would be lifetimes before I would be birthed again into this world? I had absolutely no idea that it would only be a few months till I returned in August with Swamiji as a part of a Dharma Yatra, a national tour for peace and unity. Walking into the bright lights of SFO, I felt like a newborn walking consciously and freely from the womb of my mother into a brand new world, my entrance into which was marked by fluorescent lights, conveyor belts, and escalators. I landed in Delhi at the beginning of India's summer. Swamiji was also in Delhi. He had meetings in Govardhan and Vrindavan for the next few days. We had walked into the Parikrama of Govardhan Hill the previous autumn, 13 barefoot miles, stepping in cow dung and God knows what else along the pass through the villages, marketplaces and holy fields in which Lord Krishna had danced and played with the gopis, the milkmaid devotees. On that journey, while I had been melting into ecstasy, Swamiji had been planning. 
The lack of places to sit down, the lack of facilities for drinking water or toilets, even the heaps of trash strewn about the pathway through which bare feet tread had all seemed part of the divine play for me. To him it was something that needed to be fixed for other devotees. So many people come to the sacred land to walk around this holy mountain. Many are elderly or not physically fit. Thirteen miles is too far to go without sitting down, he announced, seamlessly weaving practicality into ritual. There must be benches, there must be clean water for yatris, pilgrims, to drink, there must be toilets. Nearly two decades before he would co-found the Global Interfaith, WASH Alliance, WASH, and lead a revolution toward cleanliness and sanitation. He was already building toilets and taps for drinking water. My lack of Hindi kept me from knowing the subject of talk Swamiji had during our three days in Vraj the previous fall. I hadn't realized that while I had been swooning in devotional bliss, his bliss had manifested through improving the facilities for devotees. Now he was traveling back to Govardhan for meetings with local government officials, other concerned spiritual leaders, and business people to sponsor the work. Would you like to come? he asked, as though it were a question. Less than twelve hours after landing in Delhi, I was in the front seat of a Contessa zooming from Delhi to Madura. The vast majority of cars on the road were ambassadors, Practical, stable, chunky vehicles. The other option was the Contessa, a lower, flatter Indian version of a four-door sedan. Before seatbelts became compulsory for passengers in India in 2002, very few cars had them, and those that did, they often didn't work. Surya, this seatbelt still doesn't work, I suggested, as gently and politely as I could, as he drove 75 miles an hour down a road where rickshaws, bicyclists, and water buffaloes continually entered and crisscrossed from every side in every direction. Have faith in God, Swamiji's 20-year-old driver and right-hand man would tell me. God will protect you. Even in those early days, when the haze of spiritual intoxication blanketed most of my experiences, even while my heart was melting into my chest, even in the fullness of breath that, despite the smog, that, despite the smog returned to me the moment I returned to India, I never stopped being scared in Surya's car. When the seatbelt law came into effect, policemen stood on street corners peering into cars to ensure that drivers and passengers were wearing them. At the same time, luggage strap sellers popped up on the street corners, often the same corners as the policemen, selling thick black luggage straps. Why in the world are these guys selling luggage straps on the street? I asked. They look like seatbelts, Surya told me. See? He showed me one he had purchased the day before. You attach it here on the side of the car next to the window and place it across your body. That way, when the police look in the car, it looks like you were wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> wow, I thought. Indians have figured out a way to circumvent laws whose sole intention is to save their lives. There were always shortcuts here. The fact that a seat belt would, and a luggage strap wouldn't, save your life was a fact either lost on or ignored by Delhi drivers. Why spend the money to get a seat belt installed when, for a few rupees, you could purchase a luggage strap to imitate one? <laughs> as the years went by in my role as Swamiji's assistant or secretary or close devotee or simply the one who wouldn't go away got more solidified, I mustered the courage to reply to Surya's admonitions to just have faith in God. I do, I would tell him, and God has told me that you need to slow down. At other times I'd say, God insists that you get your seat belts fixed. American sassiness slowly wove its way into my life in India. On this day, in April 1997, though, the threads of my courage were still loose strands. 
So when I reminded Surya about the broken seat belt, he got away with saying, have faith in God. Can I come in the back with you, please? I hesitatingly asked Swamiji, who always sits in the back. I didn't want to ask, but I also didn't want to die. <laughs> the thought of which slammed into my consciousness every time Surya passed a car into oncoming traffic barreling down the two-lane highway at high speed. As the truck or car or bus coming toward us flashed its bright lights and honked its horn, Surya would slide back into our lane just in time. Each encounter I survived felt like it shaved years off my life, so I just had to ask if I could come in the back with Swamiji. Sitting in the back, of course, doesn't ensure one will survive a high-speed crash, but facing oncoming traffic while riding shotgun without a seat belt is much more terrifying than facing it from the back seat. Typically, and traditionally, there is a thick line, a wide distance that male religious renunciants keep from female devotees. In some lineages, Male renunciants won't even deign to be in a woman's presence, let alone speak to her. In most lineages, though, it's an intricate and delicate balance between the letter and spirit of the law. Celibacy, of course, must be maintained, and therefore most touch and even close proximity physically is shunned. However, for those leaders masters of their own minds and senses who have reached the enlightened state. The female body is nothing more than a differently shaped vehicle for the same genderless or genderful soul. So, over the years, I've seen young girls and even women burst into tears before Swamiji, who extends his hand to pat them on the back or shoulder or head. I have seen the same openness, the awareness that although the body may be different, the soul is one, exemplified by a few other renowned saints. Their vows of celibacy are not threatened or compromised in either letter or spirit by comforting the bereaved or accepting a young girl's spontaneous, jubilant leap into their arms when meeting after a long time. Still, over the years, I'd ask, why must these rules be followed, when the answer to why can't I come, or why can't I do that, was simply, because you are a girl. The letter of the law was followed most of the time. So the question, can I come in the back with you, was not a simple one. If there were three passengers instead of two, in addition to the driver, someone had to be in the back, especially if the third person was Swamiji's stenographer or a young student, and I could be brought into the back without much of a problem. The watchful world would understand that I was a higher-ranking social creature, despite my unfortunate femaleness, than the steno or student, and hence they would understand why I was in the prestigious back seat with the saint. But on this trip, it was just the two of us. To bring me into the back with an empty front seat sent a distasteful message. Even with other options available, I have chosen to have her next to me. But I was scared, and he had heard the conversation with Surya. Sure, he said. Surya, stop the car and let her come in the back. I can slow down, Maharaji, if you say. Surya replied with a touch of surprise. He was supposed to be the favorite, and so Swamiji was supposed to take his side and tell me he was a perfectly safe driver and I should stop nagging about seat belts, but he didn't. He let me come in the back, where I was able to stick my long fingers deep into the recesses of the cushion to pull out the seat buckle, the seat belt buckle, and snap it into place. I watched the sun rise over the fields as the outskirts of Delhi melted into the villages of Uttar Pradesh. Every twenty or thirty feet the fields were peppered with stacks of cow patties many feet high round, thick, brown patties, having dried in the open sun, were now carefully placed one upon another into tall pyramids that looked to the untrained eye like teepees for dogs or very short people. As we headed south out of Delhi, 
and into the southwestern Uttar Pradesh, I watched villagers go about their morning rituals. Men and children of both genders soaped themselves up by the side of hand pumps. They then squatted, soapy bubbles and hair of white foam beneath the spout, pumping out of their hair with the other. Sometimes they'd give the lever a few hard quick pumps and then use both hands to scrub their scalp or belly under the running water. Women bent low at the waist over fires in their front yards. We weren't close enough to see what they were cooking, but I imagined steaming pots of fragrant chai. Bullock carts laden with sugar cane shared the highway and obscured our view ahead. I thought about driving down highways in the United States where trucks or RV campers beyond a certain width had bright orange signs that read caution, wide load. I laughed to myself imagining the job of sign markers in India if those same laws applied. Caution, stalks of sugar cane rolling into the road. Caution, unsecured tons of hay falling on your car. Caution, vehicle stops for no reason. Caution, vehicle drives against traffic. Children squatted along the side of the road, underwear below their knees defecating. Their parents must have done so earlier, while it was dark. How did I get here? I wondered nearly aloud. My friends and classmates were starting the spring quarter, calculating the probability of picking black marbles from jars, diagnosing patients from clusters of symptoms, learning about neural pathways, the associated neurotransmitters, and how they correlate with neuropsych dysfunctions. And I was in the back seat of a contessa, less than a foot from a man revered as an incarnation of God himself, while children booped and bathed in the dirt along the sides of the road. I looked over at Swamiji. He had large architectural drawings spread across his lap, and was making notes in a tiny spiral pad. Benches should be over here, not here, he whispered to himself. The sun was beginning to stream through the tinted windows of the Contessa onto his hands as they delicately traced the drawings. He must have felt me watching, for he turned his head. Now the light illuminated him from behind, silhouetting his face, but not his eyes. They shone as bright as the sun itself. Yes? Yes, what? What to say? I could only smile, my eyes filled with tears. I can't believe I am here, I said. I was so worried that I might not get back. It's all God's grace, he said, and went back to the drawings. Swamiji spent the next two days in Govardhan, in long meetings, poring over enormous architectural drawings, maps of the 13-mile pathway around the five-mile-long sacred mountain of Govardhan Hill. Where would the benches be placed? Where would toilets be built? Where would trees be planted? The scriptural stories of Lord Krishna's life describe woods and lush forests where cowherds and milkmaidens roamed with their cows. But over the last many decades and even centuries, India, along with the rest of the world, has been tragically deforested. Tree planting has always been a focus for Swamiji. Written into the aims and objectives of his foundations, plantation of trees has always occupied a central place. Last page. I walked quickly to catch up with him as he led a team of local authorities in and out of the pathways of Govardhan, beside the sacred kunds, catchment pools, bearing the names of Radha, Krishna's beloved, and Shyam, one of the names of Krishna himself. Pardon me. I couldn't understand a word anyone said, but the excitement was palpable. It was my first glimpse of Swamiji in action. At the ashram, I had witnessed impassioned meetings about programs. In Pittsburgh, I had seen him run the board of trustees meeting in a mix of Hindi, Gujarati, and English, a nearly full-day event of charts and graphs and numerical, numerical reports of progress on the encyclopedia of Hinduism. But this was different. We had left Delhi at five in the morning, 
and driven three hours and, after a quick breakfast, he had gone into the first meeting, which he presided over in a way that reminded me both of an orchestra conductor and a circus ringleader. His attention did not stray for even a moment, and his arms and hands spoke as much as his lips. The district magistrate, the commissioner, other local officials, and all those gathered were swept up in his energy field like orchestra instruments playing themselves or lions jumping through flaming hoops. I sat, sometimes on the floor, sometimes on a metal folding chair, sometimes on a soft couch, depending on where and with whom each meeting was held, and in every place I wondered, who am I? And what have I walked into? These were places I'd never heard of before, places that didn't exist on any map I'd ever seen, places that had no relevance in my life till now, and at this moment, swimming in a cocktail drum of delirium, one part jet lag and nine parts bewilderment, I was designated for barefoot lovers of Krishna. I was de de uh, designed, I should say, for barefoot lovers of Krishna. Yet, other than the jet lag... Oh, wait a second. I skipped this sentence. I was wondering why that didn't make sense. And at this moment, swimming in a cocktail of delirium, one part jet lag and nine parts bewilderment, I was part of a detailed discussion about where toilets should be built on a dirt path designed for barefoot lovers of Krishna. That makes a little more sense. <laughs> but still ridiculous, isn't it? Yet it all, other than the jet lag, felt so oddly right. Of course, I was here, in this world, planning for benches and drinking water. Of course, I'd be scurrying along dirt paths with trees that had Radhe Radhe painted on them to remind visitors to chant the name of Lord Krishna's sweetest beloved, so that, by grace, Krishna would appear. Of course, I'd be taking notes on discussions being made in languages I didn't understand. Every few minutes, Swamiji would turn his head to me and say, Write that down. The blank look on my face did not deter him. Fortunately, the teenage son of one of the businessmen spoke English and would tell me, Eleven trees to be planted on the land owned by the shopkeeper who is sitting over there. He will look after the trees. And every few hours, I would wake from my open-eyed reverie and wonder, where am I? Placing it on a map was irrelevant. Like Lucy from C.S. Lewis's Narnia Adventures, I had walked through my own wardrobe and, sans lion and witch, I was home. And thus we conclude the 24th chapter of Hollywood to the Himalayas. So, thank you for listening. She is home. And that home happens to be in the middle of nowhere. India. <laughs> Despite being an American-born woman. How lovely that she takes us with us many decades later. Interweaving her stories with many spiritual lessons along the way and the absurdity of it all. Om Maing Saraswatyai Namaha Thank you for partaking in our Shravana section of our live stream, everyone. Dedicated to uh, hearing. Now my attention is back on you. We'll transition to our middle third of our Sangha, Manana. I have, uh, I have revealed the question of the day already, but I'm actually going to pause it for just a moment. I'll reintroduce it in just a second. I wanted to first thank those who sent a gift while we read Tatvamasi. Thank you for the half a dozen roses. Jayan Sargadatta Maharaj and John Simon Ritchie. Thank you for our finger heart, my friend. Om Bhairavaya Namo Namaha and E. 
Isabella. Thank you for your tiny, tiny. Yippee! <laughs> I love yourself. Thank you for your heart, me. Om Ganapataye Namaha. And thank you, Cody Jane, for your heart, me too. Radhe Radhe. Welcome, everyone who joined while we were reading. Hello, dear Lucas. Welcome, G2 Infinity, Gregor G, Andrea. Gregor G also stays barefoot and loves Krishna. It's a good combination. I think it fits. Something about being barefoot, very grounding. <laughs> Maybe that's because our soul is touching the earth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they call it that, right? I did add a couple new symbols to uh, our background board. I added a um, symbol for Zoroastrianism, which was certainly one of the most detailed symbols. And just above it, there's also the Om symbol for the Sikh faith. I actually added those two in reference to the organization that was inadvertently mentioned in our reading today, the WASH uh, Interfaith Organization. Um, I was looking at religious symbols and I saw their symbol for their organization and it had a, a lotus flower, which is something I don't have yet, and on each petal was a different symbol for a certain faith. And it was funny that was mentioned in the book, and there were two symbols on that lotus that I didn't have, and that was the uh, Zoroastrian bird and the Sikh Om symbol. So, uh, a nice synchronicity for today. But yes, I have a question of the day for you all, to start our manana, our, our reflection. Today I wonder, in what ways is nature like a mother? Simple question, we already call her Mother Nature, but why? Where does this come from? What parallels can we make between a mother and nature? Yes, I love how the lotus flowers are used in so many different ways, Andrea. A great symbol for unity in diversity. Mm -hmm. Alright, starting us off, dear Samra, you point out that nature is pure comfort. I like that. Yeah, at times, at the very least, she can, she can be pretty uncomfortable too. With all of her bugs and mud and storms. <laughs> but when she's in a good mood, right? like our mother you can't find a more sweet comfort Dr. Ginny you share like a mother nature teaches us everything we need to know I love that I concur Neon Jellopak you share that nature allows us to live our lives by nourishing us while also pushing us to grow through adversity and challenge. Oh, well said. You know, there's a word in Sanskrit that means well said. Sadhu. Sadhu. <laughs> it's a great word. <laughs> Actually, sadhu also refers to a spiritual teacher. Maybe that's how they got the name. Someone who's speaking well. Sadhu. <laughs> you are you are well said. Well spoken. Dear Greg RG. You point out a, a complimentary perspective in the same way that time is like a father. I love that. That could be a question for tomorrow, perhaps. A question of the day. Om Shuri Matre Namaha. Citations to the mother. It's a good mantra, dear Scott. She always knows best. Shares Ashley. Us humans, we think we know better than her. Uh, 
it's funny we've only been here maybe a million years if you if you consider homo sapiens around for that long civilization has only really been a thing for 10,000 years science has only really been a fully fledged thing for a few centuries at the most but nature has been here how many billions of years and we think we know more <laughs> She nurtures us and has all the natural sustenance and remedies that our body needs. I like that indigo, yes. She is uh, the medicine woman. Thank you, Scott, for your rose. Radhe, Radhe. She is divine. I love that, Anna, yes. Andrea, you shared, to you nature is so life-giving and nurturing. She has wrath, too, and in her seasons we must grow. I like that. And you know, it is through existence that we grow. The only reason that plants grow up is because gravity pulls down. Isn't it so? Well, it's a big reason. Also because the sun's up there. <laughs> But before the plant bursts through the soil, the only way to know what is up is through gravity. Tattvam Asi, you point out that nature gives and gives and overlooks your taking as much as feasible. That is very true. Yes, it takes a lot for Mother Nature to, to bite back. We've definitely done a, a great disservice to her, and I'm surprised that she allows us to still be on her planet, but I think it's because we are her still. We are part of her, her baby. She's not going to give up on her baby just like that. She believes in us to do the right thing, in my opinion anyway. Isabella, you point out, she takes care of us. We should take care of her in return. And Dr. Jenny, you share nature provides us with our every sustenance. Isn't that true? Any any part of this body that didn't come from from her? Any part of it came from uh, came from the moon? Huh? Did you eat your moon rocks this morning? <laughs> Even still, that might not be Mother Earth, but still part of Mother Nature. Mm. And in addition, you think of the correlation of space and time, Greg R.G., one could consider nature our local space. Absolutely. Yes, these are lovely answers. I'm happy to enjoy them with you, Isabella. <laughs> Mother Nature is a kind of minefield, isn't she? <laughs> well said, Canary. She must be very disappointed in our decision, says Dr. Ginny. Hmm. It's a good question. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose uh, a mother can be disappointed even if she still loves because she knows what's possible for us and we don't have an excuse. <laughs> it's true, Claudia. So we don't have any chlorophyll within us. We can't exactly absorb sunlight and convert it into energy. But we've got the next best thing, which is mitochondria. Neon Jello Pack. You share that a change of seasons and the slow growth of plants reminds you that everything happens in its own time. Yeah, you know, change of seasons and the slow growth of plants reminds you that everything happens in its own time. Yeah, you know, I think my connection has returned now. If it has, please let me know. We're back. Okay, thank you. 
She is healing, shares Bixie. It is a process. Mother Nature teaches us patience. Yes. Sadhu. Lakon and you share if everything else collapses, we seek back to our mothers. Absolutely. I know where I'm going if I have to escape civilization. Go right into a right into a nice forest. <laughs> to be fair, I'm not sure where else I would go. <laughs> G to infinity, you share she is the purest definition of beauty in our eyes. Oh, how lovely. So many terms of beauty come from her. She is a definition of beauty. We say something is as beautiful or as fragrant as a flower, as vast as the ocean, as strong as a mountain, as diverse as an ecosystem. Yeah, she teaches us a lot about virtues. She has many of them herself. It breaks her heart, shares Dr. Ginny, but she loves us anyway. Mm -hmm. To relax is key. Very true, Florian. The creative minds need to relax as you deserve it. Well said. <laughs> and that's a lovely point too, says Claude, that uh, I believe all mammals, they all start off the same gender. That's very difficult to tell the difference besides at a genetic level that it's, it's only quite late does the, uh, do the sex chromosomes really begin to distinguish themselves. And they are only one pair of 23. We are more of the same than not. And of the parts that we are the same, it's in our femininity. We all share an X chromosome. Remain neutral and stay patient, shares I love yourself. Jai, you share that she is grounding as it is to be walking in the grass. And she gives us a home, shares Gauri Chang. She holds us, shares Hybrid Jen. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be here, coexist in this time with you, dear Julia. All is for you. Such beautiful sentiments everyone is sharing. Thank you. Lakonen, you share that nature has its own laws and when breaking them, you are in big trouble. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You try to create something out of nothing, see what happens. <laughs> you go in debt. To what? I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> but that's a, uh, that's a physical law. <laughs> There are other subtle laws of our nature, too. Thank you, Julia, for your heart, me. Om Param Hanumati Namaha. And mothers are nature, shares Alia. Well said. Hello, Anazek. All right. Thank you everyone for exploring this question of the day with me. I'll minimize it now, but if you're still thinking of it, you're always welcome to share your thoughts. To me, I think it's a funny question because I don't think it's from our mothers that we get an understanding of nature. I think it's from nature that we get the understanding of a mother. <laughs> so I should have really asked, it was a bit of a trick question, in what way are our mothers like nature? 
<laughs> One of the oldest conceptualizations of the feminine is simply the word prakriti, and that means nature. That what it means to be feminine is to be part of nature. And so it is from nature that we get these qualities rather than from the feminine that we anthropomorphize, in my opinion at least. So we can open up our space to discuss anything in our hearts and minds. My attention is, is fully yours. Thank you, Bobby Sue, for your heart meet. Team bracelet and cheer you up. Om Namo Bhagavate Rudraya. Dear desolate creature, you share that we wouldn't know nature without birth with the mother. No, we wouldn't know uh, much of anything at all, for that matter. <laughs> Nature can be fierce, that's for sure. Yes. Dear Marlin, you ask, why do people have to be so mean? Are you experiencing someone mean to you? Is there some meanness in your life right now? Dear Greg R.G., you ask, will we possibly do a mantra for Lakshmi today? You heard it would be auspicious. I have another mantra planned tonight, but uh, Om Shri Maha Lakshmi Namaha Om Shri Maha Lakshmi Namaha Om Shri Maha Lakshmi Namaha How's that? Mm -hmm. Lakshmi is a form of the feminine that represents prosperity, represents the generation of, of resource so that we may cultivate a prosperous life. I'm happy you follow Nish the Fish. Yes, he's, he is really good at keeping track of all the auspicious dates. I, on the other hand, have a long way to go when it comes to all of the celebrations. Every day is holy in India. <laughs> you can't escape holidays. I wonder how that affects work. Can you say, I can't come in today, it's a holiday. Your body in India. <laughs> you can't escape holidays. I wonder how that affects work. Can you say, I can't come in today, it's a holiday. Your body. Dear Path to Happiness, you share that mean people are hurt, lost and confused. Send them love and release them. Thank you for saying that, dear Pat. Mm -hmm. And I like what you say about awakening, dear Maya, that it's natural. And the best thing that happens to people. No need to rush something, which is inevitable. And thank you, Anazek, for your quintet of roses. <laughs> Om Kring Kalikai Namaha Tattvam Asi You ask, does Purusha explore the multitude of nature of Prakriti? What is the Purusha's Dharma? Oh, what a technical question. I like this. Some background on these Sanskrit words for everyone to include you in it. In the philosophy of yoga, something you might not know, yoga 
is one of the six schools of Indian philosophy, a very practical one. So practical that when you think of the philosophy of yoga, you probably don't even think of the philosophical side, but rather the practical side of what you can do with your body. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a very deep and elaborate philosophy concerning the cosmology. It said at the beginning of time, if you can even call it a beginning, there was one undivided unity, and if it had a name, it was by the sound Aum. Um. There are kind of three levels to that sound. There's as a unified sound known as the Anunasika, the initial nasal sound, or the Anusvarda, the before sound. Then that sound divides into a vowel and a nasalization. That's where we get the two-letter form of it. I'll actually draw this out because it's quite interesting. Let's pick a nice color like uh, red. I'll do the uh, the Latin transliteration. We start with just this sound, O with a tilde over it. It's interesting that this is both a, a philosophical inquiry and a linguistic one. Then it divides itself into two sounds. That tilde comes down, so to speak, and becomes O and M. But that M is still uh, an Anusvara. Now it becomes OM. That O is known as Prakriti, and the M is known as Purusha. The O is the substance, the nature, and the M is the Purusha, the subject, the indweller of the sound, which has now become externalized. Eventually, that O splits too into A ah and U, representing creation and sustenance, and the M descends as, as dissolution. This forms the trinity of, of nature. Anyway, what is Prakriti's dharma and what is Purusha's dharma? This is the question. Well, what is Prakriti and what is Purusha? Practically speaking, Prakriti is the substance, the material nature, the elements, space, akash, air, vayu, tejas, fire, prithvi, earth, and apas, water. Prakriti is our earth, the moon, the sun, all the stars. Prakriti makes up our body. Prakriti makes up everything. Purusha is nothing but a witness that has no substance of its own and instead is the reference point for that existence to be experienced. So, their nature, speaking of the word nature, but in the, uh, the more abstract sense, is to be exactly as they are. That's their dharma. Their dharma is their nature. The dharma of prakriti, of nature, is to provide stuff. Is to provide a bunch of uh, props, like our bodies, like our minds, like our experiences. And it's the dharma of purusha to experience them, to use them. You had used the term explore, tattvamasi, and yes, exp exploration of prakriti is the dharma of purusha and in some sense explore is a synonym of witness it's just that explore has an extra sentiment of interacting with it and don't be fooled by the other term witness as being a passive phenomenon because maybe we should call purusha the explorer the searcher the seeker that which is very much a part of a process of engagement in prakriti, in nature. So I hope that answers your question. The dharma of purusha is precisely as you said. 
And thank you, dear Hybrid Gen, for your rosa. Om Namo Bhagavate Rudraya. Can't come to work doing puja, shares Greg RG. Yes, you know what's funny though is that karma, karma yoga is part of puja. And I suppose that is another difference between our culture here and in the East as work is not necessarily seen as something separate from their spiritual journey because service to the divine within everyone is precisely the highest principle behind the work that we do. And we flourish in our spiritual development by engaging in that so-called karma yoga. Dear Fleur, you share you did a past life regression and you were a British spy. My goodness, were you part of MI6? MI5, maybe? In the past, MI4? <laughs> you think that's why you're always lurking? It's so fascinating to learn about past lives. That's very fascinating. And of course, it's up to you to, uh, to choose what you want to do with that information. Maybe uh, if that resonates with you, you can ask, how can we take the meaning that is found in spying and, and put it to something more holistic in our life? Less uh, lurking, more, more conscious witnessing without need to be involved. Be the inner spy. <laughs> spy without an agenda. Spy on what everyone is doing right around you. Keep track of all of the good things they do. And when you have a moment, point it out for them. All the things they're doing right. You can be a good spy. And thank you, dear Anna, for the ice cream cone that you sent. Om Namah Shakti Shivaya. And dear Ushabai, thank you for your baker's dozen of roses. And a tiny, tiny... Yippee! Speaking of Nish the fish and being really good at keeping track of all the sacred holidays, Usha Bai is very good too and keeps me updated on them. And thank you for asking, dear Redacted. I am well. How are you, my friend? Lonely Ewok, you ask, are we birthed of nature to experience it as itself? We are nature and mother. Absolutely, on the level of the body. Did you make this body? Or did your mother? <laughs> you ask yourself, who put in the work? If you say, I did. Oh, how many cravings of food pass through your mother's mind as your body informed it what to take out of the world around her in order to forge all of your fingers and toes, your organs, your mouth, your eyes, your brain, your heart, etc. And where did that food come from? If not the big mother, Mother Nature. Yes, we are our mother, physically, of course. But spiritually, we are something distinct from nature, still something very natural, if we want to use that term as an adjective, something very uh, meant to be as part of this universe, but not of its physical nature. We have a father too, don't we? And the father is the spirit. The mother is the body and the mind. Father is the spirit. 
Actually, you could say mind is the interaction between father and mother, between body and spirit. It's what's in between. But technically speaking, if we want to be really accurate, it's part of of the material nature still, just a much subtler part that's closer to spirit than any other part. We, uh, we find value and meaning in the idea that we are the universe aware of itself. And there's truth to that, no doubt, but we're also missing something. Because in the very same context, you might hear another spiritual truth, which is, you are not the body. So if we are the universe aware of itself, and we are not the body, and the body comes from the universe, then there's something else going on here, isn't it so? Something that does not come from the universe, but is a transcendental source of it itself. And thank you for finding beauty in what we share, dear Garrett. And thank you, Pink Ladder Lady. Big Red, you ask, what are my pronouns? Well, I have, uh, I have three sets of them. I've got my first person pronouns, my second person pronouns, and my third person pronouns. First person pronouns, these are the pronouns that I use. I, me, myself, and mine. Those are the ones that I use. Second person pronouns, the ones that people use when they're talking to me. These are you, yours, yourself. But the third person pronouns, the ones that are used if a second person is talking to a third person, well, that no longer includes me, does it? If it's a third person, then I can really express what I want them to use, but ultimately it's not for me to decide because I'm probably not in the room if you have to use third person pronouns. <laughs> if you're me, then you just use I and me. If we're in it together, we use we and our. And if you're referring to me, use you and your. But uh, if you're talking to someone else, not me, then that's up to you. You can use the ones that are assumed by my body, he and him. But if you find the feminine in me, well, as we just said, my body comes from the mother. Then it would be respectful to also call it her as well, she and her, wouldn't it? I call my mother she and her. All of this has come from she and her. Why not call it she, her also? <laughs> makes no difference to me. Dear Gina Gina, thank you for your Gimme the Vote and music play. And thank you Hybrid Gen for your septet of pumpkins and a star. Radhi Radhi I relate with that, dear Flor. That is your purpose, to help others, because doing so helps ourself as we are part of a greater home. Dear Tatvamasi, you ask, if Prakriti and Purusha were so, why Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh, or are Purusha and Prakriti in all three? As I mentioned in the brief recount of Om dividing from Om to Om to Aum, that's the third layer in the cosmology. That from Prakriti and Purusha emerge Ah, the force of creation, Oh, the force of preservation, and Om, mm, the force of dissolution. 
These are, respectively, Brahma, the Creator, Vishnu, the Preserver, and Shiva, or as you said, Maheshvara, uh, the Destroyer or Dissolver. And if you haven't already seen it, I do recommend my video where I talk about the trinities of Prakriti and describes all three. Yes, their, their form is of Prakriti, but their, their source is of Purusha. The potential for them to create, sustain, or destroy, that comes from Purusha. But the actual creation, sustenance, or dissolution, that comes from Prakriti. Thank you, Jennifer, for your heart, me. Om Namah Shivaya. Speaking of Purusha, <laughs> Purusha's mouth, you ask, do we know there is a transcendental source? To ask this question literally puts it as the object of the sentence as something which is knowable. But recall that the object of a sentence is always in reference to that which is part of Prakriti, part of nature. We can only ever know objects of our experience which come from the outside world, from our senses pointing outward, into sights, sounds, smells, tastes, feelings, and thoughts. All of that comes from the material universe. But when we're talking of a transcendental source, the word transcendental means in reference to objects, that it by itself is not an object. That implies that it's not something to be known through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our skin, or mind. It is the subject. And a subject cannot be known because it's the knower. That's its role as a subject of a clause, as a knower of the known. So, funny enough, your question speaks about an answer, but the answer lies in the question, as the questioner, from where the question arises from, to whom the question occurs, that is the knower which you speak of as the transcendental source. Paradoxical, isn't it? <laughs> the knowing well said. So we can't know it directly, because directly means to put it in front of us in some way, but because it is us as the very background, then it's not going to be a part of the foreground. But we're speaking of it somehow. How so? Indirectly. Because everything that we do know must arise to a knower. So our conversation happens relative to the one listening. And so as we speak these words, though none of these words encapsulate the listener, because we are that listener, still there is a kind of indirect knowingness of this source, this witness, this perceiver. Everything that we look at is a reminder, you could say, everything that we experience, including this conversation. And very pure conversations, very subtle conversations like this one, become a very suitable mirror to reflect back that source. When we're just kind of talking randomly about this or that and the conversation's going in many different directions, then it's hard to have a, a pure sort of surface to reflect back that source. But subjects like these, literally, become easy for us to gain this sort of feeling of, of that which we are because 
our vocabulary is very pure, it must be, in order to point to such a subtle idea. Thank you, Jess TV, for your heart, me. Jaya Sachetananda. Uso, you ask, have I spoken with Sadhguru? No, well, actually, in my dreams I have. I've had a couple conversations with Sadhguru in my dreams, but, you know, not of the waking state. That's for sure. On the subject of pronouns, I like your question, Garrett. Is there really a difference? Well, of course, uh, there are differences, but there are more similarities. We are more the same than we are different. And if we bring our attention to the sameness, that definitely is, is the primary part of this existence, is in the ways in which we are one while embracing and accommodating our differences, of course. And yeah, that's funny, Greg G. Call me whatever. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> and dear Bobby Sue, you would love if I could make another TikTok video about that. I assume the context in which that comment was written was when we were talking about the, uh, the nature of pronouns. I know it is such a, an important topic today, so yeah, I will absolutely perhaps make a sequel to that video. Anna, you ask, is consciousness like a bridge from the Prakriti to Purusha? Good question. Purusha is the consciousness. Yeah. What's between Purusha, the consciousness, and Prakriti? That would be the mind. And naturally, because the mind is perhaps one of the closest things, well, it is the closest thing we can think of to the consciousness, then it's easy to think of consciousness as the bridge when we associate the mind with consciousness. But strictly speaking, Purusha is the consciousness, and the bridge is the mind. And so that begs the question, what's the difference between the mind and consciousness then? The mind is the mirror, through which we see a reflection of consciousness. The mind is the place of all forms of consciousness to express themselves through. Like, uh, like the screen. You're, you're in a movie, the mind is the movie screen, and the consciousness is the light behind the projector, which is casting images on the screen. It's easy to say that, uh, that the movie's there, the movie's taking place on the screen, but actually, the light is coming from the opposite direction, not on the screen, but in the projector. Thank you, Renvox, for your baby hippo. <laughs> Tatvamasi, you share, you feel superior at times, like we all are, that is, we all are, we all are all that is, who's there to be inferior to, but then it fades. We all have a unique slice of this experience that we call as the universe. And although I wouldn't use the word superior or inferior, if we are going to have a relative measure of experience, then 
Absolutely. There is something that you have experienced that I can learn from you, that I can look up to you to. And uh, I wouldn't be here if there wasn't something that I had experienced too that was unique to me. And therefore, there is an inferiority and superiority, just not absolutely. And not according to any kind of, of moral hierarchy, but just depending on the circumstance. You know, I would go to a doctor for medical advice. I wouldn't go to someone who makes jewelry, necessarily, <laughs> unless they happen to be a doctor, too. <laughs> And I wouldn't go to my doctor to ask questions on jewelry, <laughs> unless they happen to be a jeweler, too. And it's not that, uh, that uh, doctors are more important than jewelers, or that jewelers are more important than doctors, or that meteorologists are more important than bakers, or that bakers are more important than physicists, or whatever, you know? It is just that there is a depth of experience that is equal, but equitable to the unique relegations of that experience in each of us. All right, another cosmological question from Tatmam Asi. Does Prakriti herself rise to be Purusha and then dissolves and rise again? That's a very interesting question. Um, according to my understanding, no. It is Prakriti which is doing the rising and falling, but Purusha is identified with that one in the beginning. And that's something that's very unique to Purusha is that Purusha is said to be identical with the One, even though that One divided itself into two, only Purusha is said to be still identical with that One. It's very interesting. Whereas Prakriti is not identified with the One, but as uh, something that has come from the One. Whereas Purusha isn't something that has come from the One, but is the One now seen from the relative standpoint of what has come. And if that's messy and convoluted, I don't blame you for thinking so. <laughs> Maybe there's an analogy that can be used here. I'll just put it like this. Imagine, imagine a void. Imagine that one as a void. And then as one, there's no need to call it Purusha or Prakriti. But then somehow, miraculously, something arises in that void we call creation. Then, relative to that creation called Prakriti, that void becomes known as Purusha. So, only the term Purusha arises relative to the creation that has come, even though it has remained the same, even before the beginning, if that makes sense. If you really think about it, it doesn't, but intellectually, you can uh, classify it such. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, for your good night, too. May you have sweet dreams when you get there. Om Namo Buddhaya. And I like what you said, Billy. And I'm happy you're here. I, I read your poem earlier, and it was very beautiful and relatable to many. And you had also shared that there are so many things to be good at. No one person can be good at everything. Yes. That would take, uh, that would take the point of our diversity out of life. Then, uh, then, then all that would be necessary for life to exist is just one person. Call him Greg. 
Greg, the single human being that fulfills the role of all other human beings. Salutations to Greg. (laughs) Instead, we don't just have Greg. We have many Gregs. And we have Susans. And we have Jimothys. And we have Billys. And we have Greg Argies. We have Annas, Tatwamasis, etc. <laughs> I love that I love yourself. You share when you meet someone new, you wonder what can you learn from them or, or what can you teach them. Then you continue your journey. Beautiful. (laughs) Dear Maggie, you were wondering if I can talk about true sidereal astrology, aka astronomical astrology. Hmm. You know, I've heard this term before, sidereal astrology. Maybe you can tell me what it means. I have let I have yet to learn myself. I'm sure you could teach me. If there's something you know about it, I'd be happy to learn from you. Mm-hmm. All right, we're getting we're getting philosophical tonight, dear Anna. You ask, what's the difference between Purusha and Para Brahman? Great question. So, like how we just talked about how. Although they are identical, the source, that one, and Purusha, which has appeared to come in tandem with Prakriti as divided from the one, well, if Purusha is the same as that one, then what do we call that one relative to Purusha? And that's where the term Parabrahman comes in. That helps us understand that we're talking about consciousness as the one and not just relative to nature. Purusha is Brahman, but Parabrahman is the same as Brahman. Just now we are especially... We are specifying that uh, we're talking about it as one with Prakriti, as not something that is distinct, but from which everything arises, including Prakriti. I hope that makes sense. Para Brahman is... um, Let me put it like this. Um, it's all Brahman. It's all Brahman. Brahma Kalvidam Sarva. Sarva Kalvidam Brahma. All this is Brahma. And it gets very difficult to talk about different parts of that one when it's all one, isn't it? But we do have very specific words that can distinguish between parts of that one. The part of that one which came as nature is known as Saguna Brahman, that one endowed with form. That one as just consciousness relative to nature is called Nirguna Brahman, that's uh, that one without form. But where Saguna Brahman and Nirguna Brahman meet is known as Bhara Brahman. I hope that makes sense. It's a lot of Sanskrit, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Dear Gregorji, you share Veritasium did a great video on sidereal time. How interesting. I would love to know. Maggie, you share sidereal astrology is like it's on the side, but it's real. 
No, Western astrology isn't where the actual planets are in the sky, that's all. And astronomical astrology is actually a really small portion of astrologers. Weird but true. Interesting. It's, um... That takes into... Takes more cycles into account. I think I've heard of of uh, astronomer or astrologers taking into consideration the, the precession of the ecliptic. Isn't that? The precession of the ecliptic, I think, is, is quite a term. I still don't exactly know what it means, but I know that um, from the time we've been doing astrology thousands of years ago till now, um, our orbital plane has shifted, the tilt of our Earth, so many different cycles in our solar system and even galaxy are changing. And some say that if, if we really want to divide the, uh, the equatorial line of constellations, um, we would have to do it probably into 13 now. Is that where it comes in? This number 13, that there's a 13th constellation now, really. Very interesting. Yes, I'm only using terms I've heard, but I don't know what they mean, so <laughs> you'll have to fill in the meaning of them for me. Ah, there's a name for the 13th one. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Opiacus. And it even has an emoji. Is, is that true? Already. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Greg R.G., you share precession means cycle, basically, and the ecliptic is the orbit of the sun and moon used to math up eclipse dates. Ah. Ah, yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Ophiocas is the pronunciation. Gotcha. Thank you. I'm learning so much. Or Maggie gives an alternative. Ophiocas. 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 Well, I guess it's kind of the same, just different emphasis. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, thank you, Jessica. Hello, Miss Bliss. Jess, you ask, do I know a lot about zodiac signs? Almost nothing, practically speaking, compared to all of the very bright astrologers here tonight. Just like stars in the sky. I'm very amazed at um, just how much knowledge is, is around when it comes to astrology. I have much to learn from all of you. Maggie, you share it's a serpent bearer, this new constellation. How interesting. Makes me think of Kundalini, the serpent energy. Thank you, Dob Darker, for the harp me that you sent. Om and thank you, dear Wanda Stillwater, for your rose. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Billy, you ask, do I know anything about 5D consciousness? You just started hearing about it. I've heard about it for a while. I don't know much about it other than it comes from a New Age spirituality. And uh, 5D you could use as a synonym for the New Age. That the New Age is to usher in a, a 5D consciousness. I'm not sure about the significance of why the number 5. All I know is that it's bigger than 3. And 3D is a representative of our material world as it has three spatial dimensions. And so metaphorically, Living in the 3D means just living in the material world and all the materialism. 5D just adds some more to that, adds some dimensions of life that aren't just strictly material. And that all has to do with the coming of Aquarius, which is also astrological, given the subject matter. But given that this all is 
broadly speaking, part of what has been called New Age spirituality, um, which is not something I'm very familiar with. I'm much more familiar with Old Age spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> or you could say the eternal spirituality, the sanatana dharma, Sanskrit for the eternal spirituality. Uh, that's my forte. <laughs> Very funny, Omar. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And thank you, Unseen Styles, for your trio of roses. Om Namah Shakti Shivaya. You share that it's someone named Brianna's birthday. Well, I'm very grateful that Brianna, either directly or indirectly, is part of our Sangha today on such an important day for them. May all the experience they've had up till now in another cycle around our local star called the sun become realized and made into a brighter future. You guys are funny tonight. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, consciousness has no dimension. So, these terms must be symbolic at the most. Consciousness is the reference point for all dimensions itself. If it has a dimension, it's either zero Dimensional or infinite dimensional, of course. Consciousness as the unchanging witness. Dimension being a degree of variation. Consciousness has no degrees of variation, for there's nothing of it to vary. But of the experiences that occur to it, ah, now that is infinitely varied. And Flat Stanley is in 2D consciousness, that's right. <laughs> and Spongebob and all the other cartoons. Dear Marlin, you ask, why do people have to assume things about others when they haven't even met them in person? It's a good question. And if you'd like, I'd be more than happy to explore that question from you. From my experience, I know that questions like these also arise from something that we've experienced, and maybe we could talk about that experience. And it might be even more helpful to explore that, to ask about why we feel a certain way relative to a certain circumstance. Because Regardless of if we know the answer to not to this question, we still have to deal with it. And so, either now or later, our questions must turn inward. We might as well start sooner than later. I will say that if there is someone in your life that has assumed something about you, even if they haven't met you in person, or someone important to you, then I'm sorry. And I hope we use this space as one for us to collaboratively process those feelings that might arise. I'll add to that, that even if someone assumes something negative about you, that doesn't change who you are. That's someone's perception of you. And that perception only comes from their own experience, and their experience is limited. It speaks about their own limitations than it does about you. So, if there is any contention within yourself that maybe 
this does raise insecurities or doubts, know that what someone says about you is only an expression of their perception, and their perception is not you. Sorry to hear that, dear Adam. You must have been at the back of the bus. It was one of the dividing factors of social groups at school. Which ones would sit at the back of the bus? Which ones would sit at the front? Of course, in uh, decades prior, this was often in relation to, uh, to authority. And there were racial divisions. But nowadays, it's about who, who is a daredevil and likes to experience the bus go over a big bump and hit their head on the ceiling or the seat in front of them. And who is a goody two-shoes and sits at the front of the bus near the bus driver. <laughs> Dear Omar, you ask, would I say nothing is the same as infinity? I love that. I can tell you that Everything is finite, and that leaves us with only that which is beyond the finite to be conceived as nothing. I know that Ramanujan, the great Indian mathematician, said that zero and infinity were one. <laughs> and that's almost a pun, isn't it? <laughs> Pardon me. Dear Jacob, you ask, do I believe that humans are made to create their own purpose, or is it already chosen? That's up to you. <laughs> isn't that ironic? Or isn't that on point? That it is up to you whether you want to choose a purpose that's already defined for you in society and in, in a tradition or you could make your own that's part of your ability to choose you can you can choose to come up with it yourself or you can choose to let others choose for you now of course our body is a given the culture in which we're brought up is a given. There are many things outside of choice. But what we do with that is absolutely within our control. Circumstances, hardly ever. But our reaction and proaction to the circumstances at hand, this is something that we get to decide. Dear Georgia, you ask, am I going to teach someday, or perhaps I already do? I think the most I can do is, is continue to be a student. And all I can hope to be is, is a role model student. And that's not up for me to decide. And uh, maybe, maybe I can be a fellow student in the sense of helping each other attend to the subject matter. But that's a process that uh, I feel eternally involved in myself. Mm -hmm. Well said, Julie. You need to love everyone and then perceive instead of hating everyone, you never be able to love Yes. Dear Billy, you share that in junior high, the kids in the back of the school bus would smoke. Does that still happen? I imagine so, but, but now they have different ways of, of smoking. They have vapes, and they have, uh, what are they called, dab pens. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Humans, humans don't change. But our culture changes, our technology. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and I like that Alexander. Some say we find purpose, others say purpose finds you. And Ms. Bliss, you share that you feel as if existence is a purpose in itself. It's naturally purposeful. Now I feel my phone vibrating. Oh, it's just your aura, bro. Good vibrations. Actually, it's just my phone. <laughs> Reminding me that I've been at this a while. And it's probably time to wrap up our live stream. Over the next, let's say, 40 minutes or so. Alexander, you share, you believe in transmuting trauma into our dharma, and our dharma is our purpose. I love how you, through chain of effect, find purpose, ultimately, in the circumstances of your experience, and what you can do with them, including difficult times such as traumatic ones. Dear Georgia, you ask, do I perceive God as source? To me, they are one and the same. And God is a word that means source. And if it doesn't to you, I think then it must have gotten lost in translation. I, and I mean the colloquial you, not anyone in particular. It means so many things to so many different people, this word. But in essence, I agree, it just means source. That which everything arises from, that which is spoken of in various ways across times and traditions, that which is one in truth, but spoken of in many ways. And it's funny that you use the word perceive because it is the perception itself. Because it is from perception that all things arise in an abstract sense. We can say it comes from, you know, singularity, or divine truth. But in our experience, all of this comes from our experience. Everything that we know comes through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our skin, and our mind, our sixth sense. All of that in this field of consciousness from which it all arises. So this consciousness must be not so very different in essence than that very source if it can check all the same boxes of definition. Welcome and thank you, dear Fermon. Now, uh, as I said just a minute ago, three minutes ago, I will be wrapping up our live stream rather shortly, so I'll, I'll only answer a few more questions before we transition to our final third of the Sangha. Nididhyasana. Jaderade. That's a fun name. I like that. Do you believe in spirit or angel numbers? You keep seeing 333, 444, 555 daily the past week, and it's strange for you. I believe that, well, of course, uh, humans have come up with the idea of numbers that at the most ultimate level, there is just one. To the many, there is the one. And to that one, there is none. We might call this as separate from that and count them one, two, etc. But we only divide according to our mind's ability to do so. 
You could say that there is one wave, two waves, three waves in the ocean, four waves, five waves, six waves, etc. Or is it all just kind of a wavy one thingamajig? And there really isn't a beginning or end of any wave, just different parts of one whole. In this way, there is a, a very human part of numbers. We don't see any other creature counting. But the meaning that comes through those digits, ah, how absolutely true. If you look at anything in your experience, be it maybe three of the same digits, and that makes you feel grounded, and loved, and cared for. Maybe a certain sequence is a reminder to remember that you're protected. Maybe another sequence is a reminder that you're on the right path, and that's wonderful. And how could anyone take that meaning away from you if all it does is enhance your life? These are conscious reminders of principles that are eternally true. We might have come up with the vocabulary and the association to these things and the shape of each digit and the base system itself, but the meaning represents something that is universal. Julie, you ask if I listen to Healthy Gamer GG sometimes. Yeah, I know who you're talking about and what a wholesome individual they are. Unless there's been some new drama. I don't know. I don't keep track of that sort of stuff. But yeah, I love that they are engaging with many different gaming streamers and not just playing games with them, but having open conversations about health, both physical and mental because it can be something that a lot of gamers struggle with since video games can be an escape for a lot of people, including myself at times. And I think that's just one of the most wholesome things to do, to dedicate your professional knowledge to connect at, the, at a level of the internet, such as streaming and video games and, and bring awareness of health Oh, and spirituality too. I know he's a very spiritual person talking about meditation and whatnot with a practical emphasis on what we can do with our bodies and minds. How lovely. Jacob, you had asked, why does your ego crave such evil things? You struggle with feeding into them and feeling terrible. My dear Jacob, I would even let go of the term ego or evil. These terms arise perhaps at the surface level of spirituality, but as you go deeper, you'll notice the great, deeply peaceful beings, they actually never use the terms ego, or at least never in a negative way, nor evil. See, every part of you has a purpose. And if that purpose isn't obvious, or it's being expressed in an unhealthy way, then we can just befriend that, that's all. If we relegate parts of ourselves as separate and call them evil or egoic, then how will we be able to integrate that and make use of it, since everything has a purpose? So I think step one would be to befriend these parts of you, Allow yourself to feel the way you do and understand that you don't have to be guilty for making mistakes that you can learn from. How can we learn if we don't make them? Ultimately, your life is not going to be defined by how many mistakes you make. It's all about how you learn from them. And if in this moment there is a, a holistic process of accommodating our experiences, healing our traumas, becoming more informed on inclusive ways of living, then you are doing the right thing, even if it doesn't feel like it, yeah? Om Namo Bye.
Dear I am, you share you've been following Krishna, Hanuman and Lakshmi and they are so good to you. Why? Well, that sounds like a question you have to ask Krishna, Hanuman and Lakshmi. <laughs> it is causeless mercy. Something almost unfathomable to us humans that there can be grace given with no other reason than for the purpose of grace being given. <laughs> and I'm so happy that you found your Ishta Devata, personal form of the divine that speak to you. All right, only a few more questions before I I have to I have to start wrapping it up. And we'll end with a meditation. I feel bad not uh, answering these questions. Buddha, in your voice, you ask, what would happen if the whole world realized the distinction between consciousness and mind? I imagine in those first few moments, there would be silence. And after a while, those silence, the, those silent moments would roll off our cheeks as tears, crystallized in essence, and perhaps as they dripped past the curling edges of our lips, we would smile and begin to laugh. And I think a lot of people would hug one another. And a question would arise, what are we doing? What's with all this conflict? How can we just, you know, live together as the one that we are as consciousness, rather than a bunch of separate minds and the world would be a much more peaceful place. All right, thank you, dear Marlon. I look forward to your message. Do rest energetically. Thank you, Ragnhildar, for the trio of roses you'd sent to. Om. Nama Shakti Shivaya That's right there, Tatvamasi. Nine ways of bhakti, like the three ways to jnana. It's always nice when there's a enumeration of concepts. In Koda, you had asked, how do you move on from death? I suppose by being reborn. When someone dies in our life, part of us feels like it dies too. But just as the understanding that a part of them becomes reborn, as the energy of their being is used in new ways, so too we must discover that space in ourself that we had previously designated for them be restructured and we find ways of including new things in that space. But that is what happens after as long as is necessary for grief to take place because grief is the, the hollowing out of one's heart to make room for something more. Okay, final question. Mats, you ask, do I know how to calculate the life path number the right way? Yes. Take your year of birth Then divide it by The year that you were born <laughs> And that's your life path number Why? 
because you're all number one to me. And with that, I will be transitioning to our final third of our Sangha, Nididhyasana. May we begin our lives with a new experience. Somewhere in the middle, may we make time to process that experience. And near the end, near the time for new beginnings, let us integrate <laughs> all that which we have had so far. One second. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> All right. Gotta make sure I don't lose my voice for our mantra chanting session. Thank you, dear hybrid Jen, for your quintet of roses. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya The secret, dear Koda, is that you are already home because the perfect place for you is not one in which everything around you is full of light but the one in which everything inside you already is therefore the darkness that we experience without is the very place for us to shine we were not meant to live comfortable lives because there's no meaning in not having a challenge to overcome. You are home, you are protected, you are perfect in the process of learning, in healing, in growing. And all of that is taking place right here, right now. May your body and mind find health, but may your spirit know that it has always been whole. I would like to end tonight's meditation, well, I would like to end tonight in a meditation, and specifically I'd like to do a mantra meditation. But before I begin, I would like to clarify to dear Koda, who is going through pain, that you are not separate from heaven. As Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And where are you? You are within that. Remember that the circumstance of experience is not you. You are the ever still witness that has watched you grow in body and mind from childhood through adolescence into old age. That unchanging part of you is not in pain. The body and the mind may have experienced traumatic things and that's okay because it doesn't mean you're not supposed to be here. Your soul is always in that inner abode of light one may call as heaven. We don't experience it as so because we can only experience that which is without because from within we are perceiving outwardly and all that peace is within. We just don't realize it's already there. 
when we identify with the happenings of life, what happens to us, then we feel like in order to experience peace, that our circumstance has to be peaceful. But this life is not one for you to gain anything from without. Everything that we have come into contact with in our short life is something that we have to let go of at another time. We enter this world with nothing and we return with nothing. What does this tell us? It tells us that if there is purpose and meaning, it's not found in what happens to us, what we get from the world. It's found in what we give. Our lives are defined not in terms of what we get, but in terms of what we leave behind. You will experience peace when you take that which is already peaceful and express it with this world, which means being of help, being of love, being of kindness, being of patience, as we continue to do so, not because anyone else has told us to, but because it's our natural ability, then effortlessly we begin to experience our own inner peace as reflected around us. Thank you, Tupini, for the heart me. Radhe, Radhe, and Naomi Rose, thank you for your heart, me too. Om Kring Kalikai Namaha. And dear Dob Darker, thank you for your heart, me too. And thank you everyone for the kindness being sent to dear Koda, who is experiencing pain. And... That's what I love about this community is all of the empathy that gets shared around. So, dear Koda, I hope you take refuge in the compassion of others around you as it is a reflection of the possibility within you. And I hope you know that it's going to get better a little bit every day. And as long as you're here, I am happy to reflect back on you, all that's possible within you, but you're going to have to do the work. It requires effort to pull us, pull ourselves out of the thick of it when we are struggling, especially mentally. It requires a lot of effort at first, but with a supportive group around you, it can be made easier. It can be more inspiring. And what other solution is there? You know, there is no other option if you really think about it. The only way to live is to do so joyfully. Anything other than that is no way of living. It's just comfortable to be in pain sometimes and not begin the steps necessary to transmute that pain to something purposeful. But if you trust that no discomfort can take you from the goal, then even the process becomes peaceful. Much love to you, dear Georgia. Good night. Tonight, I would like to do a meditation on a form of the divine known as Bhairav. This is a mantra dedicated to him. Om Bhairavaya Namaha Literally meaning Om Bhairav To you, salutations. Bhairav is a form of Shiva. And Shiva is the destructive aspect of the universe. 
arising from the spiritual culture in and around India, destruction was seen not as a negative thing, but as a way to make room for something new. And so Shiva is destroyer not of goodness, but of that which is stale, <laughs> that which is no longer necessary, like our old karmas that weigh us down. All of the things that we feel burdened by, Shiva destroys. It is said that the most powerful form of Shiva is known by the secret name of Bhairava, where he is not just a destroyer, but an annihilator. And just by the English translation, annihilation has a more um, precise nature to it than just destruction. Destruction is um, chaotic, perhaps even random, imprecise, but annihilation is well thought. Annihilation is extremely methodical. And so Bhairav is that annihilator of our own karmas. It's said that calling upon his name, invoking the sentiment of this alone is enough to begin to purify ourselves. Pardon me. Of all of the things that have attached themselves to us or that we've attached to that are no longer serving us. And so I'd like to do this mantra a thousand and eight times with you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it'll take hours and hours and hours, but actually no, the audio that we'll be listening to along with is, uh, is, is actually only 20 minutes, which means that we'll be chanting relatively fast. So it'll be over before you know it. Without further ado, allow me to minimize the background music so we can maximize music of our mantra tonight. Begin. Bye-bye. 
thank you for listening or chanting along with me. That was certainly a phonetically different, difficult one to chant at such a space, a space at a pace or speed. My goodness. Yes, it was lucky that any of my recitations came through at all. <laughs> of the ones that did go through, may they be an offering uh, to all of you and the divinity inside you. May you receive all the benefit from the recitations that I intended. Good news is, is that the benefit is not derived from whether or not you stick to correct pronunciation or rhythm, as long as you intend to. And even if you mess up all a thousand and eight times, it's quite all right. You are still invoking Bhairav. Come to annihilate one's karma. Anyway, thank you. Pardon me. Namaste. Thus we conclude our Sangha for tonight and our Nidhi Dhyasana portion. I'll put the background music back up just for the last minute or two. Now thank you dear Hybrid Gen for the 18 roses that you sent as we began chanting. Om Bhram Bhairavaya Namo Namaha That's a bit of a longer version of the same mantra. Thank you, dear Sheila, for the rose. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Anazak, for the finger heart. Om Kring Kalikai Namaha And Isabella for your finger heart. Om Sum Suryaya Namaha And dear G, thank you for your pair of the votes. <laughs> Om Ganga Napatai Namaha And Pheromone, thank you for your heart me and hand hearts. Here's some for you too. Om Mani Padme Hum I'm happy, you f I'm happy you found the uh, choice of deity interesting, dear G2 Infinity. Many lives ago, we asked what the counterpart to Kali was, and we concluded that she, she ain't need no man. And so Kali was one without another. <laughs> As one of the rare exceptions to the rule that each form of the divine has a counterpart. But uh, if there was a counterpart, it would be Bhairav. But it wasn't... Uh, uh, a beloved situation because Kali definitely dominates Bhairav. In fact, she is Bhairav. She is stepping on uh, Bhairav. So uh, she she wears the pants in the relationship, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and if anything, she's probably Bhairav's mother. <laughs> so, totally different kind of relationship. Thank you, dear Michelle, a.k.a. Uh, small fries and a shake or a spaghetti on a plate for your pumpkin. Jaya Sita Ram. Mimi's time. Yes, it is time for some good. Me, 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 me. And now, dear Marlin. Inevitable, you ask, isn't Kali with Shiva? Yes, and Bhairav is in fact a form of Shiva. So you are right. Shiva is just maybe a little less fierce form of Bhairav, or Bhairav is a more fierce form of Shiva. Mm -hmm. Great question, though, and good memory. And thank you, Spiritual Vibes, for your heart, me too. As always, the greatest gift is, is just for me to be here. As cheesy as that sounds, I know that um, the monetary value of all the gifts that come my way, I'm not going to be able to keep that when I die, you know. But my ability to have been here, that is something which always remains. And so 
I truly treasure that above all else. Thus no gift is ever expected nor necessary, nonetheless it's deeply appreciated. Thank you, dear Uso. All that is possible within me is possible within you. Because possibilities are not made by our unique circumstances. They are made possible by what we share as one, as the source of potential within. Our circumstances just change the way in which we can pursue those possibilities. Uh, yeah, Shiva is the chill form of Bhairava. <laughs> He's the master meditator. <laughs> well said. Above all, let this live stream be an offering to the divinity within you. Asatoma Satgamaya Dhamma Soma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Mrittang Gamaya Om Shanti 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 That means Om lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light, from death to immortality or deathlessness. Om, peace, peace, peace. I recently learned why we say Shanti three times. We are calling for peace in three different things. It's often uh, spoken at the beginning of each Upanishad. I was reading the Rudra Hridaya Upanishad, which is, oh, such a beautiful name. It means the, uh, it means what you understand when sitting, when taking refuge at the feet of the roar, the Rudra of the heart, Hridaya. Wow. What a name. Anyway, it starts with a peace mantra, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And the particular translation that I was reading from translated what we are saying peace for each time. The first piece is dedicated to our environment. May there be peace in our environment. The second Shanti is dedicated to the peace within ourselves. And the third piece is dedicated to the forces that compel us. And so, may there be peace in our environment, may there be peace in ourself, and may there be peace in the forces that compel us. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And hello, dear Echo Leaf, and goodbye. As we are at the end of our live stream. Thank you for your trio of roses. One for another trinity, perhaps, of, let's say, the Dharma, the Sangha, and the Buddha. The teaching, the fellow students, and the teacher. Uh, please be aware that I upload the recording of these live streams to my YouTube channel, Yam Socks Live. So... Uh, never feel like you have to be here, I guess. And uh, if you ever wanted to catch up on any live stream, they're there for you. And you don't have to mindlessly scroll through them. In the description, I wrote a program that takes the transcription of each video and chapters it down to the subject, which can change on the, uh, on the time scale of minutes. So you can just open up the chapter system and click on exactly the points that you like so you don't have to waste your time with me rambling about things that aren't important to you we all have our own unique uh, interests and i respect that also to save you time i've clipped the meditations and the readings also exclusively so that they're in designated playlists in case you ever wanted to catch up on the reading without having to make it here or um 
have inspiration for your next meditation. Thank you, dear brother Danet, for your pair of baby ghosts. I don't know if you saw, but we used one of your meditations the other day. I hope you don't mind uh, for the uh, the seven point meditation. And and my goodness, how funny it was! Leaning over, falling asleep, thinking about um. What was it? You made a joke about uh, uh, the the knockoff Elon Musk version that I think comes from somewhere in Asia. Elon Ma. That was hilarious. That cracked me up. Anyway, speaking of meditations that are clipped, do check out that one that we did together and the rest of Brother Dunnett's uh, wonderful spiritual compositions, both of truth in the form of discourse, but mainly in his specialty of sound and the reverberations, the vibrations carry that guide us inward. Namaste. Thank you, Carrie Rose, for the rose that you sent to. A rose from Carrie Rose is always very fitting. Thank you, Carrie. I shall carry that rose with me. <laughs> Shivaya. And thank you for another one. Without further ado, may you have a wonderful rest of your morning, your afternoon, your evening, your night. Thank you, Brother Thanet, for a whole galaxy and for lighting up my night. <laughs> <laughs> along with the stars of many others gathered here, sharing this Milky Way we call home. I am reminded of the fact that we are stardust. <laughs> the elements of our body, fused in the hearts of stars, carry with it a destiny to create new life, and thus we are appropriately tasked this life may appear from one side of things to be samsara, as a never-ending source of creation, preservation, and destruction. But from another perspective, even here now we can find a kind of nirvana, such that this moment is no longer the source of suffering, but the source of happiness, and all that we have able to achieve here is just an expression of the bountiful, bountiful potential of the peace that exists already within and as us. And that's a great place to end our Sangha today. If there's anything I couldn't attend to, please know that my inboxes are always open on other platforms such as Instagram, email, WhatsApp, and Telegram. And I check them every day, free of charge, so keep that in mind. If you ever have a thought that you don't have a place to express, I'm always a listener. May you all have a wonderful rest of your present moment. Thank you, Tatva Masi, for your trio of roses. Jaya Nisarga Datta Maharaj. And Carrie Rose for another rose too. May we all be like flowers in the garden of life. Namaste, Namostute, Namo, Namaha.